Number 10, Spider Woman. I love Jessica Drew, but her origin story really is just straight up weird. I even was explaining it to someone who is not familiar with her as Spider Woman the other day, and even just hearing myself explain, it sounded weird to me too. I was like, J just go with me here. It's a strange story. Jessica Drew was very young when she got sick, possibly because her father had actually wanted to experiment on her. That's, I believe, I don't know if we've ever pinpointed that, but seems likely, and had chosen to expose his family to a radioactive area. Her dad ended up curing Jessica of her illness by giving her a serum based off of spiders and putting her into stasis basically for years so she could heal. Now, by the time that she was healed and emerged from the tube she was held in, she was a young adult, although admittedly, she was, as I said, healed, and she now had superpowers. But what she didn't have at the time, of course, was life experience, because she had pretty much spent all of her time in a tube. She had spent most of her life thus far in a tube in a suspended state, so it's easy to see how initially she got used as a pawn of hydras. There is also a version of her origin where Jessica was actually a woman who started out as a spider who simply evolved into a human form, which is even more bonkers of a story. Fortunately, this was later to retcon to be a false memory implanted in Jess's mind. So that's how we make sense of that. Although it is still a weird detail that someone would be like, yeah, I'm just gonna mess with her and make her think she evolved from a spider. Why not? And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd and you love when I talk about weird comic book stuff, I love talking about weird comic book stuff, check out our Top 10 Weirdest Playlist. We all talk about weird stuff over there. It's a lovely playlist. Number nine, Captain Marvel. Carol Danvers' origin started out weird and only got weirder with time, it seems. This one is weird to me, especially because I feel like it was kind of given a retcon that it didn't really need, but it got it anyways. But at the same time, I also acknowledge that the retcon may have simply been added to make Carol's origins make more sense or appear more streamlined. Carol Danvers was a security guard who ended up acting as an ally for and falling in love with the original Marvel. At one point, her life was endangered by Marvel's vengeful rival Yon Rog when the device known as the Psyche Magnetron exploded. In that moment, Carol wished that she was more like Marvel, and so she became as such because that's what happens when you get caught in a Psyche Magnetron explosion. She ended up manifesting similar powers and adopting the superhero moniker Miss Marvel. Years later, Carol has taken up the mantle of her former mentor, Captain Marvel, which is why we know her as such now, and has also learned that apparently this whole time, on her mother's side, she was actually half Kree, which is the same alien race that Marvel belonged to, which also, I guess, in part accounts for her abilities manifesting. Though I think it's kind of fine that, like, kind of a wishing machine just allowed her to have those abilities. I think that makes sense too, but half Kree, let's do it. Number 8, Bouncing Boy. Bouncing Boy is Chuck Tane. And not only is he ridiculous in terms of his own abilities and appearance, but so is his origin story. He's known for being a member of the futuristic superhero team, the Legion of Superheroes. Or he's known for eventually being a member of that team. This team hails from the 31st century, where they're teen heroes who are known not just for protecting the Earth, but also any other worlds that belong to the group known as the United Planets. Bouncing Boy himself initially was not considered good enough in the original continuity to join the Legion, trying out and failing to be accepted twice prior to finally securing his place on that team. Probably because of how odd his powers are, honestly. One day during a sports match, he made the mistake of drinking super plastic fluid by accident, which is what gave him the ability to basically inflate himself and turn himself into a human bouncing rubber ball. Why we call him Bouncing Boy. <laughs> Number 7, Hellboy. Some might not think Hellboy's origins are that weird, but I would challenge that line of thinking. I think Hellboy's origins origins only seem normal because we know him so well at this point. But it's pretty weird that an organization who is kind of known for hunting monsters would retrieve him after he was summoned by a dark World War II German cult and apparently is destined to bring about a massive apocalyptic event and yet would still choose to raise and adopt him and just raise him up among their ranks. It just seems like an odd choice, I think, when we consider his origins. I love it for him, but it's weird. Number six, Vampirella. Vampirella has to have one of the weirdest origin stories ever. Possibly one of the reasons that I love her so much. Especially when you consider how many times it has straight up changed on her. She's had a lot of retcons in her origins. I think my favorite one, though, my favorite version of her origin, though, 
is still kind of the weirdest by most people's standards. Her first origin. Although to me, this one actually feels a lot simpler than the rest of what we were given for Vampy later on with Lilith and Hell and all that stuff. I'm not talking about that aspect of her origin, but instead I'm talking about Draculon, the original Draculon, which initially was a whole other planet in outer space where a bunch of other alien vampires like Vampirella lived. Instead of having water on their planet, blood flowed through and around it. But after a catastrophic event where all the blood basically kind of like dried up, they had like a major drought, Vampy left her homeworld for Earth. She even makes her way to Earth in a very interesting fashion, basically kind of like hijacking the spaceship of some astronauts who crash landed on Draculon after discovering that the life force energy powering them, their blood, is actually drinkable to her and can act as a food source. Very strangely convenient and I love it. Number 5. Silk Silk just had a really weird life in general, never mind her origin story, although that admittedly is also pretty weird, which is why she's on my list. Sydney Moon was one of those folks who was created as a character later in terms of comic history, but who was woven into the fabric of the original history as though she was kinda always there. She went to the same school as Peter and happened to be bitten by the same radioactive spider. However, she learned much earlier on about spider totems and as a result, was hidden away in a bunker for years, growing up without much contact with the outside world. She also has a whole thing tied to Peter when it comes to her origins in terms of her feeling real frisky around him because they are bitten by the same spider, but fortunately that's in the past now. But that was a thing and it was weird. Number 4. Dog Welder 2 Dog Welder is just straight up weird and, and I feel like weird is a, is a timid way of putting that. I don't know if we'd actually even call him a hero, a straight up superhero, based on the fact that what he does sounds kind of villainous actually, but he is supposedly a part of a, you know, a superhero team, albeit a kind of terrible superhero team. But still, I feel like we kind of need to count him, even though I myself am very skeptical about categorizing him as a hero. But he is categorized as such in the comics, so here we go. The original Dog Welder was downright dastardly, but Dog Welder 2, his successor, is is at least not really fully in control of what he does and definitely has, you know, one of the weirdest origin stories ever as a result. So, at least he's a little bit better but also weirder. He ended up stumbling upon the original dog welder's equipment and became possessed by it, compelled to weld dogs to people. Despite having what seemed to be a happy life with his family, Dog Welder 2 could not stop himself, could not resist the urge from welding his kids to the dog. As a result, his wife divorced him and later remarried. That's what you do. Also, what a weird story. Also the fact that he's still holding out hope, like maybe one day I'll be able to talk to them again. I don't think you come back from that, my friend. I think you're done. Number 3. Howard the Duck Howard the Duck hails from a planet known as Duck World, where apparently ducks are not only intelligent, but also, coincidentally, happen to speak English, as so many on Earth do. What a coincidence. As weird as that sounds though, what's even weirder is the way Howard got to Earth, which is kinda debated in the comics, with a few different stories telling this tale. Although I personally like the version where it's mentioned that Florida is basically located at the center of the nexus of all realities of Earth 616, which I think is pretty wild and pretty funny and kind of great. I also love that in that version of the story that's kind of where like Howard first appeared was in the Everglades in Florida. It's just funny because he obviously is also supposed to be a parody on Donald Duck, so yes. Number 2. Scarlet Witch Wanda Maximoff has one of the most simple and yet at the same time convoluted origins in all of comics. Initially she was simply a young woman who was a mutant and was saved by Magneto alongside her brother Pietro, aka Quicksilver. Feeling indebted to Magneto for saving their lives from an angry mom, Mob, they pledged themselves to Magneto's cause, serving him as members of his Brotherhood of Mutants, or Brotherhood of Evil Mutants if you prefer. However, later on, we learned that Magneto was also their dad, and that the children were simply adopted by the Max Mobs. It's kind of have like two groups of parents. Wanda's magic would go from mutant originating hex powers, to being tied to Cthon, to chaos magic, to simply just magic that was passed down from her mother, who was also known for being a powerful witch. And Magneto would go from being unaware father, to birth father, to emotionally complicated dad, to Magneto, you are not the father. And more recently was like more of an adopted father to Wanda and Pietro himself before he 
kick the bucket. Although he'll probably be back at some point soon if he's not already at the time of this recording. Wanda would go from being mutant outcast to mutant villain to mutant pretender, having been revealed as someone who was simply made to look like a mutant after being experimented on very early in life by the High Evolutionary for some reason, and finally back to being cool with mutants again after she was able to help them access sort of lost consciousness backups for mutants long thought lost and therefore unresurrectable. Basically, Scarlet Witch is just weird. It's, that's the only way it goes. Doesn't matter what part of the origin story we're at, it's crazy. Number one, Jessica Jones. Jessica Jones is another one of those characters who is retroactively given close ties to other heroes, with her character having been created later on in the early 2000s. But if you thought Silk was wild, Jessica goes pretty crazy into that. She had a crush on Human Torch, went to the same school and was in the same grade as Peter Parker, and her dad worked for Tony Stark. What? She would end up being exposed to radioactive chemicals in a tragic car crash that the rest of her family perished in. During her first flight, where she lost control of her powers, Thor saved her. Thor. Shortly after this, Jessica would take up the superhero name of Jewel and would end up almost immediately afterward being controlled by the Purple Man and forced to do what he bid her. All in all, her origin is pretty messed up and also just pretty wild. Number 10, Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler. Oh boy. I still think to this day one of the weirdest facts about him is that he's the son of Mystique and Azazel, a demon who claims to be the devil. Azazel is also weird in the sense that he comes with his own lore as part of a race of demonic mutants known as the Neophem, who were opposed to a race of angelic looking mutants known as the Chearophem, that apparently Angel is also one of. Nightcrawler would be abandoned shortly after he was born by his mother, who was fleeing an angry mob. He'd be taken in by a family tied to magic, the Zardoses, and later would also end up dating his foster sister, Jermaine Zardos, who we'd later come to know as Amanda Sefton. Which I mean, granted she was kind of undercover at the time, but still, I feel like if you know your foster sister, you know, you know who your foster sister is. Don't think her being like, my name's Amanda would change it for me. I'd be like, wait, but you look exactly like my foster sister. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd and you love when we talk about weird stuff, we have a weirdest playlist for you, you to check out. So go check that out after. Number nine, Booster Gold. Booster Gold is a time traveling hero from the future. And from the look of him, you might not even guess this, considering that for a hero who should hail from a more advanced timeline, he often isn't known for being one of the best or the brightest. Booster Gold was actually Michael Carter, who was born during the 25th century in Gotham. His dad left his family when he was young to pursue his obsession with gambling and leaving his family deep in debt. In order to help his sick mother, Michael would eventually also follow in his father's footsteps to earn the money he needed to help her get well again. His mother would end up being saved, but following the revelation of how Michael had gotten that money through gambling, was also shamed by her son's actions. Michael decided to make things right and set it on a path to make something of himself. And while working as a security guard at a museum was inspired by the heroes on display there, stealing tech from the museum to travel to the past and become a hero himself, also using his knowledge of the past that he had as someone who came from the future. So he's actually a security guard from the future with basic museum tech, using it to parade around as a hero, which is pretty funny, especially when you consider Skeets his, his little droid that flies around and helps him out actually is just like basically security tech from the museum. It's like one of those things that's supposed to walk you around the museum and be like, this exhibit is this. Here is the history. Number eight, Jean Grey. Jean Grey is not a character you likely think of when you think of unbelievable origins. However, there are some things that I feel like we gotta talk about. Probably you wouldn't think of that because her origin is often explained away by her status as a mutant. But trust me, Trust me, it, it gets kind of weird. Jean was only a young girl when her powers first manifested, with her mind becoming bonded to the mind of a young schoolmate, just as said schoolmate was hit by a car and basically lay dying. This left Jean pretty much traumatized, and her parents ended up reaching out to Professor Charles Xavier eventually for help. Xavier ultimately placed a mental block in Jean's mind in order to protect her against her insanely powerful telepathic abilities. Years later, Jean would join his school for gifted youngsters, and Charles would also also creepily fantasize about what a potential romantic relationship would be like with Jean. Pretty weird, considering everything else we now know. Although he knew this would of course never be possible. Not because he was, you know, years her senior as well as her teacher and her mentor, but because he was confined to a wheelchair. Those are his thoughts, not mine. Oh Charles. Number seven, Hitman. Definitely a strange one, and thank you to Pablo in the comments for the suggestion, um, who suggested it on my part one. Well, I'm not really sure if it was intended as a suggestion, but that's definitely 
only how I took it. So here we go. Hitman is Tommy Monahan, the son of a lady of the night who was based in Gotham. His mom, named Catherine Monahan, took to naming her children after the men who used her services and who were the biological fathers of said children in an attempt to um, shame them. However, Tommy's father, Tom Dawson, was not a fan of this and actually warned Catherine, threatening her life, that she should not do that. Stubborn, she did so anyways with him, which resulted in her life and the life of her offspring, save Tommy, being lost. Tommy would grow up in a Catholic orphanage and would go on to serve in the military before becoming a hitman. Despite the fact that he was an assassin in the DC Universe, Tommy was still considered to be a hero because he avoided killing people who he deemed to be good. During one of his jobs, he ended up in a confrontation with a a bloodline parasite, a dragon-like parasitic alien, who attempted to kill him by drinking his spinal fluid, because that's that's what those guys do. The parasite's attempt failed, and afterwards, Tommy observed that he now had low-level telepathic powers. This is a true story from a comic. I mean, it's not a true story, but in the comics world, it's a true story. That happened. Number six, the Fantastic Four. While the Fantastic Four have become an iconic superhero team as Marvel's first family, when you think about it, their origin story is, uh, Pretty strange. Reed Richards was the mastermind behind their transformation, which actually happened not by his own design, but kind of by accident. After facing the threat of a loss of funding for his Starship project, Reed decided to prove the merits of said project by taking his Starship, the Marvel One, on a test flight, which would thereby prove its worth should the flight be successful. Which, of course, Reed was like, it'll be successful, it'll be great, we're not gonna worry about the fact that I shouldn't even legally probably be doing this. While his friend Ben Grimm was always set to pilot this flight, Reed also also agreed to bring along his girlfriend, Susan Storm, and her younger brother, Johnny, who at that time really had no space or flight qualifications to speak of that I know of. And thanks to a storm of cosmic rays, the four were forever changed by the flight as we know. It's weird that the four of them were the ones that ended up on it. Especially Sue being like, hey, can I bring Johnny, my brother? <laughs> it's like, sure, why not? We got four seats, let's do it. Number five, Green Lantern. For this origin tale, we're going all the way back to the first Green Lantern, Alan Scott, who also technically isn't really the same kind of Green Lantern as those who would come after him. Instead of being given his powers by the Lantern Corps and the Guardians of the Universe, Scott was basically given his powers and saved by the Green Lantern of Life, later established as an entity held prisoner by the Guardians, known as Starheart. In the original story in All American Comics issue number 16, the green light first crash landed to Earth and used its flame in China to bring death, then in America, new life, curing a man who was once insane, and finally, saving Alan Scott and granting him the gift of power. Which I also feel like that's kind of weird because it's like, at first uh, there was death, then there was life, now there's power. But, I'm like, but you also saved Alan Scott's life, so technically it was like death, life, life, power. Life power. It's like two gifts, really. Number four, Dazzler. One of my all time favorite heroes in the comics, Alison Blair, definitely has a strange origin. She is a mutant, which, relative to comics, is not actually that strange, of course, because there are many mutants. In Marvel Comics, there are many, many other ones at this point that exist, and they have actually become probably some of the most popular groups around in terms of the comic publisher. However, even among mutants, Alison's story is kind of odd. After learning her mutant powers, she was not compelled or inspired like so many others out there to become a hero. Instead, she wanted to use her powers to entertain others and give herself a uh, kind of a career boost. Allison's powers often get downplayed, but they're actually insanely powerful. She can transmute sound into light. She can use this light to do a bunch of different things, including shooting powerful lasers, creating massive light explosions, and completely obliterating her enemies. Like literally, she's turned people into, I mean, nothing, because they were just like vaporized, basically. But that's never really been what Daz is actually about. Instead, she usually just wants to sing and perform while on tour with her band, while being accepted for who she is by the world as well as her family and her friends. Built into her origins was also the mystery of what happened to her mother and a dramatic relationship with her father, who kicked her out after she didn't follow in his footsteps and become a lawyer. And I love that these are like major things in her series, <laughs> as opposed to it being about, you know, like constantly fighting bad guys. That happens too, but it's always like, oh boy, how'd I get myself in this situation? Number three, Martian Manhunter. John Johns definitely has a strange origin story that sounds so fantastic to imagine, especially when you consider some of the weird coincidences involved in it. He was born as a twin, highly unlikely in Martian culture. His twin, however, was considered a mutant, born without any telepathic abilities. As such, his brother, Ma Alefa'ak, grew up to hate his people and
and created a virus to destroy them that infected Martians through their telepathy. On Mars, John was a police officer and in an attempt to protect his family against this virus, he tried to convince them not to use their telepathic gifts, which they did try to do, but unfortunately that didn't work. This failed and he lost both his wife. This failed and he lost both his daughter and his wife who went up in flames as the virus preyed on the Martians natural fear of flames, intensifying it to the point that those infected would simply just like burst into flames. Shortly after this, he was pulled to Earth via an experiment of Dr. Saul Erdel, who created a device in an attempt to communicate with aliens, aiming this device at Mars. The device reached across space and time and captured John, who was brought to Earth and made to forget this past trauma through Erdel. The two had basically developed a mental link, and Erdel used this to craft a different backstory for John, which was implanted in the Martian's mind. And he did this kind of as a kindness to like help him get over everything that had happened to him. On Earth, John would disguise himself as a human police detective going by the name John Jones. Number 2. Magic Magic definitely has a pretty weird one when it comes to her origin, and I saw all y'all in the comments on part 1 being like, but where's magic? Magic should be on here. You're right, magic is pretty cool, and that's why she's so high up on this part. She is the younger sister of Colossus and Mikhail Rasputin. Initially she was kidnapped and held hostage in exchange for the X-Men fighting to free Arcade from Doctor Doom's clutches. Once safe, she ended up moving to the US to live with her brother and the X-Men. However, shortly after this move, young Liana was once again kidnapped, this time by the powerful demon lord Belasco, who sensed great power in her and took her to Limbo. Here she would be raised to become Belasco's possible heir and also his tool, with him exerting control over her. Eventually she would return home and would also conquer Limbo, usurping Belasco to become the Dimension's ruler, forever changed from her terrifying time, being both tormented and kinda trained in the Hell Dimension. Interesting. Number 1. The Flash what gave the Flash Barry Allen his powers? It turns out he did. Well, initially in the comics, Barry is seen as getting his powers from being doused in chemicals and struck by lightning in his lab. Following the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, it was retconned that the lightning that actually struck Barry was in fact kind of because of Barry, who was kind of transformed into lightning following his death in Crisis. In Secret Origins issue number 2 from the 80s, we learn that Barry went back in time and kind of gave his past self a choice between becoming a hero and having a shorter life, or possibly having a longer, more normal life. Barry of course chose lightning, and here we are. So in a way, Barry actually gave himself his powers because of the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, which is mind mind blowing when you think about it. It's a paradox. Number ten, Hit Monkey. Hit Monkey. Huh. Oh man, I love Hit Monkey. Initially, Hit Monkey was just a monkey living up in the mountains until a human assassin wandered wounded into his clan. They took in the human and nursed him back to health. The monkey who had become Hit Monkey was nervous about the man's presence and at one point rebelled against his clan for their decision to continue to offer refuge to the assassin. Monkey violently struck out and was banished as a result. However, during his time away, he spotted other armed men in the wilderness and rushed back to warn his clan, but unfortunately, he got there too late. They had all been killed in the attack, with the assassin also dying. Swearing to get revenge, Hitmonkey was born that day, as he wielded the assassin's guns and would continue to be guided by the spirit of the dead assassin, who helped him on his quest and also sought to resolve his own unfinished business through Hitmonkey. <laughs> and friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love weird, wacky lists like this, click that subscribe button. We do a lot of cool stuff like this and you're not going to want to miss it when it does pop up. Number 9. Green Lantern In part 2 we talked about the original origin of Alan Scott's Green Lantern, but now we're going to talk about the amazing and also unbelievable origin of one of the newer Green Lanterns, Sojourner Moline. Jo has a fascinating origin in the sense that she was chosen to become Green Lantern for a sector of space known only as the Far Sector. That's how far out it is, it does not have a designated number, it's just Far Sector. Also interesting and unique is that Joe's Green Lantern ring that she was given is a special kind that is basically self charging, doesn't need a battery, making it perfect for cases out in remote areas of space. However, while this is a great strength and some would consider this ring to be like one of the strongest, it can also be somewhat of a weakness because it actually takes time to recharge by itself, meaning that Joe has to be a little bit more conservative and creative at times when using her powers in battle, being careful not to fully tap herself out unless, you know, she absolutely has to, but she has to make those choices. That's what makes it so exciting. 
Number 8, Elasti Woman. Whether we're talking comics or the live action Doom Patrol series, Elasti Woman has a pretty interesting origin. She was initially a Hollywood actress, Rita Farr. In the Doom Patrol series, it's implied that she was cursed for being rude to locals while on set, falling into a body of water where she was exposed to a toxic gas that left her with the uncontrollable ability to shapeshift. Ultimately, this kind of ruined her career. In the comics, it was exposure to toxic gas from a volcano while on a shoot in Africa that gave her this ability. Also, of course, ruining her career, she would end up joining Niles Calder's team of misfits known as the Doom Patrol. In the live action series, Rita constantly struggles to control her abilities. In the comics, she also becomes the adopted mother of Garfield Logan's Beast Boy, who we often nickname Gar, after marrying Steve Dayton's Mento, another member of the Doom Patrol team. Number 7, Rogue. Well, when it comes to Rogue, she's a pretty tragic and honestly pretty wild backstory. Initially, we knew her as a villain in the comics, but this wouldn't last too long. With Rogue eventually leaving her adoptive mother's sides and joining the X-Men. From the beginning of her origins, Rogue's backstory has been pretty wild. She was initially born into a hippie commune out in the wilderness. Her mother ended up disappearing in a mystical ritual when she was young, which left Anna Marie to be raised by her stern aunt Carrie her mother, Priscilla's sister, and her often absent father, Owen. Eventually, Anna Marie would run away from home, gaining the nickname of Rogue because you know she kept to herself, which would eventually also become her codename as a super. She would end up being taken in by Mystique and her wife, Destiny, with the two villainesses becoming, you guessed it, Rogue's adoptive mothers. Initially, Rogue's powers manifested during her first kiss with her childhood crush, Cody Robbins. As a result, Cody's life energy was drained from the physical contact and he was left comatose. Thanks to this very traumatizing experience, for years, Rogue struggled to control her powers, often choosing to wear clothes that fully covered her body for fear of accidentally hurting those closest to her. It wasn't until recently in the comics that she managed to gain better control over her mutant abilities when she finally confronted her fears, realizing that it was actually her own fear that had been preventing her from controlling her powers the whole time. Number 6, Oracle. When you think about it, Oracle's origins are pretty insane. I still can't believe this happened, considering the story that her origin comes from is not even fully canon. Oracle is Barbara Gordon, and we aren't talking about Barbara Gordon's initially confusing connection to Commissioner Jim Gordon and her origin as Batgirl here, but instead her transformation from Batgirl to Oracle with her Oracle origin. This all went down in Killing Joke, initially intended to be a one-off story that was not part of the main continuity canon. And for the most part, it really isn't. However, in the story, Barbara Gordon is visiting with her father, Jim Gordon. Dressed as a civilian, she answers the door and is shot through the spine by the Joker. And for some reason, this is the part of the story that was kept and incorporated into canon. The silver lining is, it gave us Oracle, I suppose, which is a super cool character. But the unfortunate thing is it created a lot of trauma and extra struggle for Babs, with her also having to retire as Batgirl for quite some time. Number 5, Red Hood. We're not talking about Jason Todd's origins as Robin here, instead we're talking about his origin as Red Hood. And I know that some may consider Red Hood to be more a villain at times or anti-hero, but one, anti-heroes are still also heroes, and two, I would consider Todd's Red Hood more of a straight up hero right now than well, anything else. I mean, he did switch from guns to a crowbar, it's still pretty brutal, but hey, progress. Jason Todd became the Red Hood after he was believed to have been killed by the Joker. First of all, this death was actually voted on by fans, which is a pretty wild marketing strategy and pretty crazy that that's part of this origin. And after he died, his death was considered to be one of the actual mainstay deaths in comics, with the three permanent deaths in comics at one point being considered to be uncle. Ben, Bucky Barnes, and of course Jason Todd. Evidently not so permanent as two out of three of those characters have now at this point in time ended up returning, albeit you know after a long period I will say of staying dead, unlike most other fallen heroes and characters. Jason returned however as the villain Red Hood. In the story it was explained that he was revived via time spent in basically the Lazarus pits, being taken in and trained by Talia al Ghul and the League of Assassins. That's kind of like how he recovered and how 
how he became Red Hood a little bit. However, do you even know how any of that was made possible? Hmm? What well, was actually a change made to the universe that was one of many explained by Superboy Prime punching reality? Yeah, even more bizarre, the punch actually happened in terms of the comics continuity in terms of their release dates after Todd returned. But that's explained by the fact that Superboy Prime's punch actually affected all of reality throughout time. So while it did happen afterward in terms of when the comics were released, it affected the past, which means Jason Todd actually came back to life six months after his death in the adjusted canon. Which would actually even be like way back when. So people were like, but didn't this happen after? And it's like, yes, but like this actually doesn't even, it affects way in the past, really. Oh, Superboy Prime, punch in reality. Number four, Ben Riley. Ben Riley is a superhero who we would often come to know mainly as Scarlet Spider. But before that, we actually just knew him for a while as. Spider Man. He is the clone of Peter Parker, who was created by the Jackal, although there was a period of time where Peter and Ben were not sure which one of them was the clone. And it was even believed that Ben may actually be the original, with Peter being the clone. Beyond that, Ben Riley, while being created by Miles Warren's Jackal and tormented by the villain, would also at one point go on to adopt the name for himself, becoming the Jackal, which is pretty messed up when you think about everything that's happened to Ben Riley. Number 3, Robot Man. Cliff Steele is DC's Robot Man. For those unfamiliar, he is one of the mainstays on DC's oddball superhero team, the Doom Patrol. Whether we're talking about the live action adaptation or the comic book origin for this character, both are honestly pretty similar and pretty weird. Basically, Cliff Steele was a NASCAR driver, additionally in the comics an obsessive thrill seeker, not exclusively a race car driver alone, and during a car accident, his body ends up being destroyed. With his brain still surviving, however, his life was saved by Niles Calder, who gave him a cybernetic body, which is how he became Robot Man. Unfortunately, a much more rudimentary robot body though, than other super heroic cyborgs like, well, Cyborg. In the live action series Doom Patrol, Cliff's origin is made even more unbelievable. And we learned that this version of the accident happened not on the track, but after the race while on the way home. Cliff had been having an affair and his wife found out. But at the same time, he also found out that his wife had found out and then so she had had an affair and she let him know kind of in the worst time possible. She revealed this to him during his race, causing him to almost get in a life threatening car crash. The two, however, after the race decided to renew their commitment to one another and ultimately try to salvage their marriage. I guess you know, a near death experience can do that to you. While on their way home with their young daughter Clara in the back seat, Cliff ended up getting into an accident tragically with a large logging truck. The accident cost his wife her life, Cliff his body, and left his daughter alive but severely traumatized. Even more wild, in the show, we'd actually later learn that Cliff getting into this accident was kind of all part of Niall Calder's experiments as he sought to find a way to become immortal. Now that is unbelievable. Number 2, Longshot. Longshot is the son of Shatterstar and he's from Mojo World. So, he's pretty much as weird as it gets just with that. Longshot was basically created as a clone of Shatterstar who ended up being sent back in time to the Mojoverse by Mephisto. But it also gets even weirder for this character when you factor in his jumps back and forth from the Mojoverse to Earth and back again, and it gets even weirder when you factor in Shatterstar's origins. Number 1, Shatterstar. As I said, to really appreciate the mind-blowing nature of Longshot's origins, you need to know Shatterstar. So, Shatterstar is actually the biological son of Longshot and another mutant with a weird origin story, Dazzler, who we talked about on part 2 of this series. Which of course means that Shatterstar and Longshot are in essence one another's fathers in a way, <laughs> with both their origins being tied up in what I would call a time paradox. I think that's what that is for sure. Longshot is Shatterstar's father, but after traveling back in time, Shatterstar's DNA would be taken and used to create Longshot. In essence, also making him Longshot's genetic father. So yeah, they're both each other's fathers, they both exist, and they're both really confusing. Number 10, Dead Man. Dead Man first appeared in Strange Adventures, number 205, in 1967. And while he is rarely, if ever, talked about in the same circles as most of the other origin stories on this list, I find his origin relatively unique and compelling. Boston Brand was a daring circus trapeze artist known for his gruff exterior that hid a heart of gold. This gruff exterior caused him to have a lot of people who disliked him. He was known for performing death-defying acts while dressed dressed in a corpse-like mask, until one day, during his show, he was shot and killed by persons unknown. 
Due to him being well liked by the Hindu goddess Ramakrishna, Brand was allowed to stay on Earth as a ghost so that he could help protect the innocents and track down his murderer and bring them to justice. He is invisible to pretty much everyone, but he has the power to enter the living and possess and control their bodies, which really sets his story apart from other heroes. His story is interesting because it tackles mortality as well as regret, and it is a catalyst for a lot of growth for Boston, despite the fact that he is a dead man. Number 9. Captain America Captain America first came on the scene in late 1940 in Captain America Comics number 1, featuring the hero punching out the leader of the German army almost a year before America entered World War II. His origin is beautiful in its simplicity. A frail man who has been deemed unfit for service in the US military desperately wants to serve his country, and agrees to undergo an experimental procedure that will grant him incredible abilities. Before the formula can be used to create more super soldiers, a spy destroys the formula and kills the professor who created it, leaving Steve Rogers as the only super soldier. He becomes Captain America, but his secret identity is soon discovered by a young boy serving as the regiment's mascot named Bucky Barnes. And Steve decides that the most reasonable way to deal with this is to bring the small child with him into an active war zone as his sidekick. The nuances of his origin have been explored more in the years since, but it is otherwise unchanged and was very faithfully adapted in the MCU film adaptation. Not so much in the weird 70s made for TV movie though. Interestingly, the first time we meet Steve in the comics is when he's undergoing the procedure, so we don't really get to know anything about his character before he is Captain America. Number 8. Wonder Woman In her initial appearance in 1942's All Star Comics number 8, Wonder Woman's origin was that she was the daughter of Hippolyta, the queen of the Amazons. Hippolyta desperately wanted a child and prayed to the gods to bring life to a clay statue of a little girl that she had made. You know, like Pinocchio. Aphrodite granted her wish and the clay became a real girl. She was raised as an Amazon, quickly learning and excelling in their ways. The Amazons lived in secret on Paradise Island until a World War II pilot named Steve Trevor crash landed. Diana saved his life and decided she wanted to come back to the world of man so that she could fight the Axis powers, as well as be with Steve, who she thought was a certified hottie. The Amazons held a competition to determine who would go, and Diana one, being allowed to go to the modern world, and being given her iconic costume, tiara, and lasso of truth, and she became Wonder Woman. Her origin story has been tweaked several times over the years, with the time period changing and her being sent as an emissary from her island, but for the most part, it has stayed pretty much the same. Number 7. Captain Marvel First appearing in 1940's Wiz Comics number 2, Billy Batson was an orphan living on the mean streets. One day, a strange man in a trench coat approached him and told the young boy to follow follow him into an abandoned subway station. He did, and the man revealed himself to be a wizard, and took Billy to the Rock of Eternity. The wizard Shazam told Billy that he had been chosen to be the wizard's champion, and gave him the power to transform into a manly superhero who had the wisdom of Solomon, the strength of Hercules, the stamina of Atlas, the power of Zeus, the courage of Atlas, and the speed of Mercury. He could transform whenever he used the magic word Shazam. So remember kids, if a strange man ever approaches you, and asks you to follow him into an abandoned building, go with him. He is probably a wizard who wants to give you powers. Billy's origin has had a few alterations over the years, but the broad strokes are pretty much unchanged. What has changed over the years is his name. After Fawcett Comics was sued by the company that would become DC for alleged copyright infringement, they claimed Captain Marvel was a ripoff of Superman. Captain Marvel was cancelled until DC bought the character and decided to bring him back. By that time, Marvel Comics had their own Captain Captain Marvel, and though DC was allowed to keep calling the character Captain Marvel, the book had to be renamed Shazam. Eventually it was decided it was simpler if they simply called Billy Shazam, though his name will apparently soon be changed to simply the Captain. Billy's origin is great as it is the ultimate child's wish fulfillment power fantasy. While children in comics at the time were relegated to sidekick roles, Billy was able to be the strong hero anytime he wanted with just the utterance of a magic word. His origin does a great job of tapping into a really primal desire, and it's one of my favorites. Number 6. 
Iron Man. Tony Stark was a wealthy weapons designer who was kidnapped by radicals. In the attack, shrapnel was lodged in his chest that would result in him dying within a week. His captors lied and told him that if he designed weapons for them, they would give him a life-saving surgery. Tony knew they were lying, but played for time, creating a metal chest plate that acted like a pacemaker, keeping him alive. Him and his fellow captive, Yinsen, secretly created a robot mech suit so that they could escape, but as it was charging up, their captors came to check on them. Yinsen sacrificed himself to allow Tony to survive, and Tony used his first Iron Man suit to take out the cell and escaped back to America. He soon decided to become a superhero, but kept his identity secret for much of his history by claiming that Iron Man was actually his bodyguard. It's an interesting origin that has aged really well, all things considered, with it having a lot of thematic weight, tackling the idea of the consequences of the military industrial complex, and Tony being one of Marvel's most flawed heroes. Number 5. Daredevil Matt Murdock was the son of a boxer named Batlin Jack Murdock. Jack wanted his son to have a better life than him, and forbid him from ever fighting, making him study as much as possible instead. His unwillingness to fight earned him the ironic nickname Daredevil from his bullies. One day, Matt saw a blind man crossing the street and about to be hit by a truck. Matt heroically pushed him out of the way, but was struck himself. The truck was carrying a radioactive isotope, which got in Matt's eyes, blinding him, but granting him heightened senses that allowed him to do incredible feats. He trained to be an incredible fighter and acrobat in secret, and grew up to be a lawyer. His father was paid to throw a boxing match, but decided to win the match, and was killed by a villain called the Fixer. Matt took on the Daredevil persona to avenge his father's death and defend the people of Hell's Kitchen. In the 80s, Frank Miller reworked Matt's origin a bit, introducing elements like a blind mentor named Stick, but overall this relatively unique origin stuck, giving everyone one of Marvel's coolest heroes, while also providing representation for disabled people. Number 4. The Hulk While testing his gamma bomb for the US military, Professor Bruce Banner realized that a teenager had wandered onto the test site, so he got him to safety, but was caught in the blast himself. This changed him so that whenever he became angry, he would transform into the Hulk, a giant green, or grey, rage monster. The monster is frequently misunderstood and chased by the military, resulting in destructive rampages from the creature, but he has also tackled his fair share of supervillains, saving the world several times. The Hulk has changed a lot over the years, going from grey to green in his first few appearances due to printer issues, being transformed by the setting sun in his original stories, then using a gamma ray machine to control the transformations, and eventually having them be triggered by emotional stimuli. But the cause of Bruce's powers has remained consistent in the many years of the comics, with its atomic Frankenstein meets Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde themes providing Marvel with one of its most unique and interesting characters. Number 3. Spider-Man We're in the top 3, but really, any of these next ones could be number 1 depending on your personal preference, due to each of them being absolutely iconic. When a teenager named Peter Parker was bitten by a radioactive spider, he was granted spider powers, which he decided to use for personal gain, spending time as a wrestler and a television personality. One night, a thief ran past Spidey, and Spider-Man decided not to stop him, thinking it wasn't his problem. In a strange coincidence, the robber broke into Peter's home, resulting in the death of Peter's Uncle Ben. Spider-Man went after the crook, and upon recognizing him, was racked with guilt that his inaction resulted in an innocent life being lost. He vowed to be a hero and realized that with great power, there must also come great responsibility. All of this is present in his first appearance in Amazing Fantasy number 15 from 1962, and has remained virtually unchanged due to how strong it is. The idea of having the catalyst of the hero's heroics be his fault adds a layer of guilt to the proceedings that helps define Spidey as a character, and it really doesn't get much better than this. Number 2. Batman When Bruce Wayne was a child, he and his parents were walking home one night when they were confronted by a robber. The robber, later named Joe Chill, shot Bruce's parents, leaving them dead on the pavement in front of the traumatized young boy. He made a vow to dedicate his life to fighting crime in Gotham City, and spent his formative years training his mind and body to be the ultimate crime fighter. When he was grown, he was almost ready, but needed some way to strike fear into the hearts of criminals, as he knew that they were a superstitious and cowardly lot. At that moment, a 
bat flew through his window and he was inspired to become Batman. Over the years, this origin has been expanded upon and his time training has been more fleshed out, but that's his origin and it's perfect. It's dark and gothic and perfectly suits the character. It is so ingrained in our public consciousness at this point that we're kind of sick of seeing it or even hearing about it whenever the character brings it up in media. At this point, you could just have Batman show up and never mention why he does it and everyone would still know. And that's the mark of a strong origin. Number one, Superman. When the planet Krypton was about to be destroyed, one child was placed in a rocket and sent to Earth so that he might survive. Once on Earth, this child was raised by a kindly couple who taught him right from wrong. When he grew up, he decided to use his powers for good and be a superhero. Disguised as mild-mannered reporter Clark Kent, whenever trouble strikes, he becomes Superman. This origin was present in its broad strokes with the character's first appearance in 1938's Action Comics No. 1, which features the doomed planet and sent to Earth in a rocket elements. A year later in Superman No. 1, the story was expanded upon, introducing the Kents who took him in. And in the years since, the origin has been reinterpreted and expanded upon, but all of the initial elements are still present. Although, in her first appearance, Clark's mom is named Mary, which is funny because in the years since, they've made a pretty big deal about her name being Martha. I think this origin is one of my favorites due to how classic it is, but also the fact that it is essentially just the Old Testament story of Moses, showing how storytelling and myth has evolved over the years while still having similar themes show up over and over again. Kicking off the list at number 10 is the Ultimate Red Skull. In the Ultimate Universe, Steve Rogers and his girlfriend at the time, Gail Richards, shared a sweet night of romance together way back in 1945, just before he went and got himself popsicled. Nine months later, out popped a sweet baby that the government decided needed to be kept a secret. They took the boy into foster care on a military base, training him to become a super soldier to take the place of his missing and frozen father. He soon became stronger and even more tactically skillful than Captain America was. But even though he seemed to be the perfect soldier, Rogers' son had in reality been carefully planning his escape. Now fast forward to 1963 when he was finally at the age of 17 and the son went off the handle, removing all the doctors and soldiers at his facility of their lives. If you didn't gather that this guy was absolutely insane, he also used a kitchen knife to remove the skin from his own head, officially and literally becoming the Red Skull. In rebellion against the system that created him, he becomes a mentally unstable assassin and tries to eventually steal Reed Richards' plans for the Cosmic Cube in order to use it to change history so he could grow up with his father. It was absolutely psychotic up until that very last point. Number nine, Dr. Doom. Victor Von Doom was the child of Romani people living in Latveria. His mother was a sorceress, and after her passing at the hands of Mephisto, resulting in her soul being held hostage by the Hell Lord, and the later passing of his father, Victor began to study her books, teaching himself the dark arts, while also developing a keen scientific mind which made him a legendary scientist and inventor at a very young age. This led to him being tracked down by the US military and offered further education in the United States. It was here that he met Reed Richards and the two became intellectual rivals. Doom wanted nothing more than to save his mother from the hold of Mephisto, so he became obsessed with developing a machine that could project the astral form of a being into other dimensions, seeing it as a way to free his mother's soul from Mephisto. One day, Reed Richards went into Doom's dorm without permission and saw that he was working on the device, but Reed saw as an unstable dimensional portal to an unknown realm and pointed out all the ways that it wouldn't work. Doom refused to listen since he was peed off at Reed for going into his dorm and looking at his stuff, but also because Doom's plans were based on an understanding of the supernatural that Reed just didn't appreciate. Reed, however, was right, and the machine ended up blowing up in Doom's face, literally, causing him to be disfigured. Despite that initial failure, through magic and other means, once a year, every single year, Doom would challenge challenge Mephisto for the fate of his mother's soul, and he almost always loses. Number 8, Ultimate Mr. Sinister. Again in the Ultimate Universe, Mr. Sinister is reimagined as a former bioengineer who specialized in urban stealth and mind-altering substances to create a super soldier who could evade any form of detection and hypnotically persuade others. Unfortunately,
Unfortunately, his superiors refused to allow Nathaniel Essex to test his research on human subjects, so he experimented on himself and acquired superhuman powers. But he also became a schizophrenic street thug with a white tank top, weird tattoos, and a proclivity for gunning down mutants to please his Lord Apocalypse. But his Lord Apocalypse isn't even real and it's just a hallucination slash an effigy Sinister has constructed out of trash. This Lord Apocalypse inside of Sinister's head would preach about ushering in a quote final age of mutant dominance or the end of the world. But to do so, Sinister apparently had to remove 10 innocent mutants from existence. Four issues of the X-Men chasing down a delusional mutant murderer were some of the best from the Ultimate X-Men's extended run. Number 7, Earth 17 Overman. On Earth 17 that appeared very briefly in Animal Man issue number 23, superheroes are a product of government experiments. The Superman of this universe is called Overman and he was the first hero with all the other heroes being spawns of his own DNA. That seems pretty normal for a comic book, it feels very The Boys, but just like The Boys, things get really weird. Overman ends up catching some kind of promiscuously transmitted disease from another person, which somehow drives him completely insane. Overman destroys Earth-17's Justice League and reduces the entire world to rubble. And that was all before he gets his filthy paws on an incredibly powerful doomsday device that he intends to use to wipe Earth-17 out completely. But before he does that, he is temporarily transported to the main DC Universe. The crisis on Infinite Earths destroys this reality which seems like an effort by DC to destroy such a naughty Superman story. They even created different, less weird, but still evil iterations of Overman, like an Overman who became allied with the Axis powers in World War II. But the internet, we never forget that kind of thing, you weirdos. Number 6, Dexstar. It's true, the Red Lantern of Sector 2814, Dexstar, is an irrationally rage-filled kitten cat. And he's scary, but it's all because he really loved his owner, which is kind of sweet. Dexstar's origin shows the cat Dexter with his owner when she is attacked by robbers who broke into her home. While Dexter tried his best to scratch the attackers, they ended up bringing a close to the life of Dexter's owner. When the police showed up on the scene though, Dexter was kicked out into the streets so he wouldn't contaminate the scene. So this cat lost his owner and his home. That's bad enough, but then two sickos from the streets found Dexter when he was trying to sleep, put him in a sack, and threw threw him into a river. This unbelievable and unfortunate sequence of events filled this poor little kitty with enough pure unbridled rage that it caught the attention of Atrocitus, who called out to him and made Dexter a Red Lantern. With this newfound power of the Red Lantern ring, the rage kitty exacted sweet revenge on the sickos who sacked him and flew to say goodbye to his owner one last time, saying in his little cat language, I find who hurt you, I kill, I good kitty. Number 5, The Joker. There are many variations of the Joker's origin story, with no one version being officially accepted. And that's because he either doesn't remember the real one, doesn't want to tell anyone, or is just so insane that he makes up a new one every single time. It's part of what makes the Joker so compelling. The most popular of his origin stories, though, sees him as a civilian named Jack. Jack leaves behind a career as a chemical engineer to go into stand-up comedy. When he fails miserably, he turns to a gang of criminals in order to support his pregnant wife. The criminals name him Red Hood and set up a robbery at a chemical plant, threatening and or taking the life of his family in order to force Jack into working with them. At the plant, the gang are taken down by security and in the terror of seeing Batman as he fled away, Red Hood slash Jack falls into a vat of chemicals. When he emerged being drastically physically altered, he also ends up having a complete and very, very drastic psychotic breakdown and focuses obsessively on Batman for the rest of his life. Number four, Monsieur Mala and the Brain. When I tell you that a super intelligent French militant gorilla named Monsieur Mala and a disembodied brain belonging to a French scientific genius and master criminal are not only the primary leaders of the Brotherhood of Evil, but are also in a relationship together, then you know this is going to be wild. So, Monsieur Mala and the Brain, who were villains to both the Doom Patrol and the Teen Titans, first appeared in Doom Patrol number 86 in 1964. Brain was once a scientist who experimented on the gorilla who would become Mala, increasing Mala's intelligence. Unfortunately, an accident injured Ernst, the scientist, and Mala had to remove Ernst's brain and place it in a technological holding device to keep him alive and able to communicate. 
communicate, and thus the villainous duo were born. The two are almost always together, with Mala usually carrying around the brain. Their story, and even the characters themselves, are odd to say the least, but so are the Doom Patrol, so it all just kind of makes sense in the end, doesn't it? Number 3. Bane. Bane was born inside the feared Pina Duro prison on Santa Prisca, an island in the Caribbean Sea, after his father, Edmund Dorrance, escaped and had the corrupt government transfer his life sentence to his unborn child. That alone is just so messed up. This child was forced to serve his father's prison sentence is named Bane by a prison warden after he took the first of many lives while still growing up. Bane spends his time in prison building himself into the perfect specimen of physical and mental ability, teaching himself strategy, philosophy, languages, and mathematics while also turning his body into the example of peak fitness and strength. Bane becomes the quote king of the prison and is its most feared inmate. Being such an incredible specimen of a human being, Bane is selected for use in a super soldier experimental program being injected with a lethal substance called venom. But unlike any other before him, Bane not only survives, but he finds the venom further enhances his already outstanding physical abilities. But with the caveat that it must be taken every 12 hours. To help that, a system of tubes is installed on Bane to pump venom directly into his system. Them. It's not too long after that that Bane sets his sights on dominating Gotham City and its bat themed protector. In at number two, it's Cheetah. Cheetah was initially a famous archaeologist named Dr. Barbara Ann Minerva. She was a bit, um, I don't know what's the word, quirky? With an obsessive love of artifacts and not much of a care for other human beings. But still, she wasn't exactly evil. Not at first. Minerva stumbled upon an ancient tribe in Africa that was protected by a female guardian with the powers of a cheetah. Super cool. So cool that when she is told the legend of this female hero by a witch doctor, she believes she can become the next cheetah. To do this, Minerva has to become the bride of a plant god by the name of Urz Kartaga. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. She fulfills all of the requirements to become his bride, ingesting a mixture of human blood, berries, and his leaves. But while things seem to be going smoothly, she was not told the key requirement, that she needs to be a virgin. Since Minerva is not a virgin, she is instead cursed to suffer severe pain when she's in human form and have an insatiable bloodlust whenever she turns into cheetah. And finally, in at number one, it's Armless Tiger Man. If any of you know me, then you know Gustav Hertz was going to make this list. Gustav worked in a mechanical laboratory in Munich, Germany during the 1940s, but unfortunately for Hertz, one day his arms got caught in a machine and had to be amputated. While this is a horrible thing to happen to anyone, Gustav did survived the experience and he was later given reading material on how to operate day to day without arms, instead using his mouth and feet to complete daily tasks. Turns out that he was really really good at this. Hertz developed ridiculous skill in using his teeth and feet. He even took things a couple steps further. He sharpened his teeth into fangs that he could use as weapons and tools and he even developed above average levels of strength and dexterity in his jaw, legs, and toes, allowing him to bend steel with his mouth, kick really really hard, and throw daggers with his toes. He ends up proving how capable he was as a World War II enemy of the hero Angel and an enemy of Wakanda, where he was completely destroyed by that era's Black Panther. I will talk about Armless Tiger Man whenever I have the chance, and I am not sorry about it. Coming in at number 10 today is Galactus. Being one of the constants in Marvel Comics since 1965, Galactus is a big name in comic books, and yet I feel like there's a good chunk of people who may not know his origins. Galactus was known originally as the space explorer Galen from a planet called Ta. The civilization he belongs to was the most advanced of any of the known universes at that time, and Galen was a genetically engineered child of one of Ta's greatest scientists. But Galen and his society existed in the previous iteration of the Marvel multiverse, the sixth cosmos. Essentially, in Marvel, the universe starts off as a cosmic egg, or a sphere of disorganized, dense, compact matter. This sphere undergoes a big bang that hurls the matter outwards where it eventually condenses into to stars, planets, moons, and all that good stuff. It all expands in size for billions of years and then it begins to go in reverse, undergoing a quote, crunch over the next billions of years, all heading toward a central point in the universe where it all restarts again. That, or it was a giant entity known as the Black Winter. Either way, Galen and the surviving people of Ta attempted to face the end of the universe by leaving their planet on a ship. Sadly, the cataclysm caught up with the ship and everyone passed except for Galen. 
Galen, who was approached by the sentience of the universe who merged his power with Galen, allowing him to survive as Galactus, the devourer of worlds in the next cosmos. This one. Number 9. Parasite Joshua Michael Allen When talking about the origin story of the villain Parasite, there are a few different stories we can tell. but. They're all nuts! The most current version of Parasite is a guy who used to go by the name Joshua Michael Allen. Josh was originally a bike courier from Metropolis, but his life changed when he very randomly came face to face with a massive green booger looking monster. He was having a rough time and so he kind of snapped, attacking the monster and getting a massive electric shock. He then lost consciousness. When he came to, he was diagnosed as suffering from alien flu. He also lost his job and got dumped by his GF in the same stroke. So that's pretty sad. It was then that he was called into Star Labs to be checked for the virus. All of a sudden, a random explosion at the lab took out everyone nearby and transformed Joshua into a purple grotesque monster called Parasite. As Parasite, he uncontrollably and suffering from a crazy level of hunger, drained the energy of people around him leaving them as husks. However, the Man of Steel came to intervene and when Parasite touched Superman, he gained way more energy than he had from anyone before. From that point forward, leeching metahuman powers became his new obsession. Number 8. Solomon Grundy Cyrus Gold lived a pretty miserable life. His father, Gold Sr., had moved to Gotham City to gain fame and fortune and failed miserably. The Elder Gold began to use his family as a way to vent off the hate he felt towards his superiors. For years, the young Cyrus Gold was mistreated, coming to a head when his mother packed her belongings, kissed him goodbye, and abandoned him alone with his horrible father. Not too much later, Cyrus snuck down to the docks to watch his father work when a crate fell on top of Cyrus Gold's father, taking him out of the picture instantly. Now, Cyrus Gold was all alone. Forced to survive on nothing, he swore to himself to make his own riches and power. And miraculously, a mysterious stranger offered Cyrus the deal of a lifetime. He could become rich and powerful if he only served the stranger until the day he died. Cyrus Gold shook the stranger's hand and what do you know, he soon became wealthy and powerful, but by ways not very honest. He took people's lives, including his mother and various people who had bullied him in the past. He stole and he became a horrible mobster, notorious for dumping the bodies of his victims in the waters of Slaughter Swamp. During this period, Cyrus somehow got married and had a little boy and a little girl as well. Initially, they were a happy family, but Cyrus became a worse and worse husband until, in a fit of rage, Cyrus took his wife's life. A mob formed and chased him into the swamps. Now, Cyrus didn't want to go by the mob's hands, and subsequently, he stuck himself through the heart, sinking into the cursed waters of Slaughter Swamp. Now, the swamp filled with unknown acids and chemicals bonded to the preserving corpse of Cyrus Gold, fusing his body through time with wood, stone, and pretty much anything else that was unlucky enough to fall into the swamp. Fifty years later, after his passing, something happened. In the dead of night, a moaning was heard. The waters rippled and parted as a hideously decayed white hand reached out. That night, from the remains of a selfish and evil man, came a hulking avatar of the Grey, known only as Solomon Grundy, naming himself after a famous poem. That was a long one, I'm sorry. Number 7. Killer Croc As with most DC characters, Killer Croc, aka Waylon Jones, has two main origin stories, the pre and post Flashpoint origins, with some minor differences. Born in a slum in Tampa, Florida, Waylon was born with a congenital medical condition that caused him to have scaly thick skin and reptilian features, which led to the Croc part of his name. This is true in both origins, although post Flashpoint this condition was given a bit more depth as Waylon and tried to scrub away the scales for years. Now, with his mother passing away from his birth and his father abandoning the little croc, Waylon was raised by his aunt, but she had a bit of a problem with the drinky. As a teenager, croc had no friends and was bullied for his medical condition, as is usually the case in a villain origin story. So, instead, Waylon grew up and found himself literally wrestling alligators as part of carnivals. Post Flashpoint, this was the Gotham Circus, where he even came into contact with the Flying Graysons. This was where he earned the name Killer Croc, but carnivals aren't exactly swimming in the cash. And post Flashpoint, his boss was keeping his money, prompting Croc to bite off his arm. Croc soon realized that there was more money to be made in crime, so he set out to become Gotham's most powerful crime lord, taking out other rising criminals, gathering up some henchmen, and seizing control of the Tobacconist Club and or the Gotham City Sewers, bringing him into conflict 
with the Batman. Number six, Professor Zoom. Hunter Zolomon was already starting off life with a bit of a disadvantage, and that's because his dad was a notorious killer who lost his life to the police after taking the life of Hunter's mother. So yeah, it was pretty bad. Trying to move on with his life though, Hunter became obsessed with understanding the criminal mind, studying psychology and criminology in college, and eventually joining the FBI alongside his girlfriend, whom he later married. Nice. Unfortunately though, during one case, Hunter made a bad call regarding a criminal they were after and it resulted in Ashley's father losing his life. Hunter actually was correct, but the whole thing was orchestrated by Reverse Flash Eobard Thawne. Ashley left Hunter and the FBI terminated his employment, leaving Hunter with a damaged knee due to the case and a cane for walking. After getting a job in Keystone City as a profiler, he was eventually paralyzed by Gorilla Grodd. After forming a relationship with Wally West, Hunter begged Flash to go back in time and change his life, but the speedster refused. Hunter took things into his own hands and stole the cosmic treadmill, which exploded, granting Hunter the power to live between the seconds of time and making him zoom the second reverse. Flash. Number 5. Superboy Prime Superboy Prime was initially a normal child on an Earth known as Prime Earth that didn't really have any superheroes. Or they had superheroes in the exact same way that we do, in comic books and entertainment media. This young future supervillain was adopted by Jerry and Naomi Kent, who named him Clark, which was both Naomi's middle name and the fictional comic book character Superman in their world. Well, it turns out that Clark really was Cal L, teleported to Earth Prime before the Krypton of this universe was destroyed when its sun went kaboom. Discovering his Kryptonian abilities thanks to the passing of Halley's Comet, while coincidentally dressed as Superman at a Halloween party, this Superboy left his prime Earth reality shortly afterwards. As it happens, the Earth 1 Superman just happened to be passing by and asked him to join other heroes in protecting reality itself from the Anti-Monitor during the Crisis on Infinite Earths. His reward, along with Alexander Luther Jr. of Earth 3, was a chance to escape to a heavenly pocket dimension where he doesn't age. Unfortunately, being able to watch the post-crisis Earth that was getting darker and darker without being able able to be a part of it, losing his childhood, knowing that he could never grow up to be Superman, his idol of Earth 2, and feeling like the heroes of post-crisis Earth were absolute dog water, Superboy Prime became a pretty bitter guy. He escaped with Alexander and instigated the Infinite Crisis, and then he went on to be an incredibly despicable bad guy. Number 4. Doomsday Doomsday is essentially just pure destruction. He was able to bring down the Justice League and take the life of Earth's premier hero, Superman, in his first appearance. Doomsday doesn't speak. He can't be reasoned with and the only way to stop him is to beat him harder than he will beat you. That's because Doomsday was created on the planet Krypton as the ultimate life form, tested against that planet's harsh environment and eventually against the Kryptonians themselves. Doomsday's whole life cycle involves it being killed and then coming back stronger than whatever took it out. Over decades and decades that involved literal thousands of repeated deaths, Doomsday essentially became a nearly undefined defeatable monster with no other thought process beyond destroying everything in front of him and just moving on to the next thing. All he does is punch things to pieces and the only way to stop him is to try and punch him to pieces however you can before he can punch you to pieces. Number 3. The Maestro Hulk Maestro is the dystopian future version of the Hulk, the variant of Hulk that haunts his own dreams. He rules over the creatively named city, Dystopia, as an incredibly evil and immoral dictator. Years and years and years of radiation due to the nuclear conflict that spawned this dystopian future had made Maestro sick and villainous as well as twice as strong as the base level Hulk but with all the intelligence of Banner to boot. This bearded green behemoth has been a fan favorite character since his introduction in the future imperfect storyline and his backstory, fighting the human torch, Doctor Doom, Namor the Submariner and Abomination is pretty intense and it's a super fun read. Not to mention his debut where he fights the Incredible Hulk and defeats him like it's absolutely nothing to him. Super cool. You should check it out. Number 2. Vulcan The third and youngest Summers brother, Gabriel Summers, has been used by multiple different parties since his birth. His mother, Catherine Summers, had her life taken by the Shi'ar Emperor Ken as a punishment for his father, Christopher Summers' own actions. He was basically paying for his father's crimes, which sucks. The Shi'ar 
Shi'ar took Gabriel and artificially aged him up and essentially used him back on Earth. So he was robbed of his childhood, which essentially meant that Vulcan has a tendency to act like a huge brat sometimes. It's a big old baby. After being saved and mentored by Maury McTaggart, Vulcan was drafted into an early team of Professor X's X-Men that got almost completely perished at the hands of Krakoa. Professor X then used his powers to wipe everyone's mind of the memory of this team of X-Men, which was incredibly messed up. Unbeknownst to Xavier though, Vulcan absorbed the energies of his teammates and was actually able to survive, spending years in Earth's orbit, just kind of inert and floating there, until the events of M-Day awoke him. After coming back and fighting the X-Men and Xavier for some understandable vengeance, Gabriel took off into space and essentially took control of the Shi'ar Empire, marrying the black sheep of the Shi'ar royal family and using his massive power to beat the royal guard, take the life of Deacon, and place himself on the throne. And finally, in at number one, it's Thanos. Look, I know we all love Thanos as a villain. He's terribly ruthless, massively intelligent, and sickeningly powerful. But my lord, is his origin messed up. Thanos was born on Titan, a moon of Saturn, and is technically an Eternal. Unfortunately though, Thanos was born with a deviant gene, which made him very different looking from the rest of the Titan Eternals, with purple thick hide like skin and a much larger body. These differences caused Thanos' mom to try and change his life status from alive to lights out. And when that failed, he was ruthlessly bullied as he grew up. As such, Thanos wasn't the happiest child, and he distanced himself from his society, instead investing himself in science, life and death, and he also started dissecting animals all Dahmer-like. Thanos found he has a thing for death. In fact, he met and started to fall in love with the literal physical embodiment of death in Marvel Comics, Mistress Death. To prove his love for her, he would commit some of the worst crimes, starting with the dissection of his mom, the bombardment of his home world, and eventually assembling the Infinity Stones and trying to wield the Cosmic Cube to destroy all life in the universe. Kicking off the list at number 10 is Ultra Boy. This one is interesting, as you'd be totally forgiven for laughing at this character, but then you'd have to say sorry, as you just insulted an incredibly powerful dude. Ultra Boy, or as he is known in his civilian guise, Joe Na, possesses many of the same superpowers as Superboy, including superhuman speed, strength, flight, stamina, breath, vision, and invulnerability, which he gained from being swallowed by a massive space energy beast, which is essentially a giant space whale, hence the biblical Jonah name. While he was inside the energy beast's stomach, the radiation inside altered Jonah to give him superpowers. Now the only issue with Jonah, and it's a big one, is that he can only use one power at a time. This means that if he wants to fly through space at super speed, he must wear a spacesuit to survive in the cold vacuum, or when using his power for super strength, he is not invulnerable and can therefore get tired, feel muscular pain, or even pull a muscle. Jonah can switch these abilities almost instantly, but needs to make the conscious choice to do so, which honestly sounds kind of exhausting to me. I don't know. Number nine. Puck. The Alpha Flight member known as Puck was at one point literally just a little person who pushed himself to turn his body into an almost perfect physical specimen, able to lift hundreds of pounds and fight as well as his fellow Alpha Flighters. But this was before his Alpha Flight days. He had tons of adventures and his pretty basic but mysterious backstory added to his likability. But that ain't the dumb part. The dumb part came later on when it was revealed that Puck was actually much older than he seemed and was not actually born as a little person. Apparently, Puck used to be seven feet tall and was a mercenary and adventurer who was born near the start of the 20th century. As a merc, he was hired to steal the Black Blade of Baghdad, and he totally got it, but then it unleashed an ancient magical being known as Black Razor. In order to defeat the being, Puck sucked him into his own body, becoming immortal in the process, but also losing half of his height and being trapped in the form of a little person. Why couldn't he just be a little person? I don't know. Number eight, Elongated Man. When Ralph Dibney was a tiny little Ralph Dibney, he saw a contortionist at a carnival and he was instantly down to be able to be like that guy. Everyone has their own thing, okay? And for Ralph, his thing was trying to figure out how someone could twist and fold their body into all sorts of shapes like that. Obsessed with learning the secrets of the contortionists, for years and years, Ralph figured out that all the contortionists he observed 
drank the same drink. Now it's not some crazy formula, it's not some kind of tea, but it was actually a popular soft drink known as Gingold. Now Ralph knew for the most part that it was just a coincidence that they all drank the same drink, but that doesn't mean he wasn't gonna bet everything on it. Ralph literally taught himself chemistry, which should be the superpower itself, and he used his newly found chemistry skills to create a super concentrated extract from the fruit that was the basis and heart for Gingold, the Gingo fruit. And what do you know, the super concentrated extract allowed him to make any part of his body stretch to ridiculous degrees. What's that I hear you say? Why yes, this does make no sense. Number 7 Wally West Between roughly 1950 and 1970, 90% of superhero origin stories involved either chemicals or radiation. That's just how it worked. The Flash, we are all most familiar with, Barry Allen, became the fastest man alive when he was working at his forensics laboratory one night and a freak bolt of lightning struck his rack of chemicals and also Barry himself. In a stroke of luck, instead of completely frying the guy, the electricity from the lightning mixed with the unique and specific collection of chemicals and it gave Barry Allen super speed and access to the speed force. Now while that origin may give you some pause, it's a classic origin story and most of us has just come to accept it. Now, three years after The Flash debuted, Barry Allen was visited by Wally West, the nephew of Barry's girlfriend, Iris. Wally was a big Flash fan, so Barry took him on a tour of his lab, the very lab where he was struck by lightning. Well. What do you know? A rogue bolt of lightning struck the very same rack of chemicals, all of which were still stored alongside each other, and then the lightning struck Wally West. The electricity mixed with this apparent unique collection of chemicals, unique enough to have it happen twice, and can you guess what happened? Yeah. Wally West gains super speed and access to the speed force. It's not like it doesn't make sense for an event to produce the same outcome, but I guess lightning really do be striking twice, huh? Or we got lazy with the writing. Uh, you pick. Number 6 Black Condor A young Richard Gray, who would go on to become the flying superhero Black Condor, was the only survivor of an attack by Mongolian bandits on him and his archaeologist family. Now, stuck alone and in the wild, the little Richard was taken in by a family of condors. In the same way Mowgli was taken in by wolves and Tarzan was taken in by gorillas. Unfortunately, Richard wasn't a bird. He didn't have the musculature or the feathers or anything really that allows him to take flight like his new family could. But what are millions of years of evolution compared to the human brain and a little bit of practice? Richard spent most of his life studying the birds until he actually managed to teach himself how to just fly. Oh, there was also the exposure to a radioactive meteor, but he truly believed he had taught himself to fly. Once he was discovered by a missionary, Gray headed back home to the United States where he became the flying adventurer known as the Black Condor. He went back specifically though to save a certain US senator, but when it was too late and he just happened to look exactly like the senator, he decided to abandon the name of Richard Gray and instead took the politician's identity. I think Richard Gray actually just might be insane. I think yeah. Number 5 The Flaming Carrot You would be forgiven for not knowing of the superhero known as the Flaming Carrot. For one, the Flaming Carrot has been published by different publishers from Aardvark Vanaheim, Renegade Press, and Dark Horse until 2005 when he began being published by Image Comics. The other reason is because look at him! He's utterly ridiculous! His ridiculous look is matched by his equally ridiculous origin though. Essentially, the Flaming Carrot became a superhero after being bet to read thousands of comic books, specifically 5,000 comic books. Somehow, reading 5,000 comic books caused this unknown man to have brain damage and then he appeared with a giant carrot for a mask which had apparently an eternal flame on top of it and he became a crime fighter. That's, that's it. His gear and equipment is pretty equally nuts too. He has a utility belt which contains a yo-yo, a lucky rabbit's foot, laughing gas, magnifying glass, band-aids with little stars and rockets on them, silly putty, a skeleton key, stink bombs, a decoder badge, Pez candy, a magnet, a bubble pipe, super glue, a wishbone, trading cards, invisible ink, sneeze powder, and fizzies. That's his gear, alongside a nuclear powered pogo stick and flippers that he wears at all times just in case he has to swim. Cause you never know.
Number four, Wizard. Bob Frank and his father Emil were traveling through Africa when they both unfortunately came down with an extremely deadly illness. Needing a transfusion in order to save their lives, Emil made it a mission to find someone who would be willing to help them and to save Bob's life. Apparently, there was absolutely no one who could help them out. But then, to make matters so much more worse, Bob also got bitten by a very deadly cobra. Bob was not having a good go of things here. When that happened, a mongoose then just showed up and it introduced that snake to the afterlife. Of course, this must have been a sign and Emil had the idea to use the mongoose for the transfusion instead of a human to save his son's life. <laughs> Don't worry about how a mongoose and a human are completely different. He was going to save his son's life, goddammit, okay? He was gonna do it. Now, not only did the mongoose DNA running through his veins actually save his life, but naturally this had the added benefit of allowing Bob to now run at super speed. Apparently this was also just common information as Emil explained it as nonchalantly as pouring a cup of tea. Later on, it would be revealed that Frank had natural powers that were just jump started by the addition of the mongoose DNA, but of course, that's only after the writers realized how that makes no sense. Number three, Fat Man the Human Flying Saucer. Once upon a time, there was a pretty ordinary wealthy man by the name of Van Crawford. Van was an expert on all things hobbies, and he owned a string of hobby shops. Well, Van here just happened to be waltzing along when he spied in his little eye an alien flying saucer crashing into the earth. Now being such a nice guy, Van decided to clear the space for the saucer to land, even pushing over a tree to do so. Very nice. Crawford came face to face with an alien, and it turns out that this alien was the flying saucer he had seen. This race of aliens seems to be able to transform from their normal form into a flying saucer, which is honestly a pretty spectacular ability to have. Luckily for Van though, after the alien gave him a drink that seemed to look and taste like a chocolate milkshake, he also gained this awesome and unique ability to transform himself into a human flying saucer. It's honestly really fun and kind of super charming that I really enjoy it and uh, I think we can all agree that it's kind of dumb still though. Number two, Spider Ham. Hailing from a universe where all the Marvel characters are replaced with cartoon character, animal versions of themselves, Peter Porker is Spider Ham. A pig. Peter Porker was actually born a spider named Peter, and he lived in the basement lab of May Porker, a scientist who had created the world's first atomic powered hair dryer. May Porker, using the atomic hair dryer, accidentally irradiated herself, and then she bit Peter the spider, which made him turn into an anthropomorphic pig, just like her, only with the relative powers of a spider. In his premiere issue, he would go on to do battle with Hulk Bunny, created when Bruce Bunny was trapped in an arcade cabinet and bombarded with gamma radiation. I wish I was making this all up, I really do, but it's also kind of awesome. Spider-Ham has most of the same abilities as 616 Spider-Man, only he has the rather unique ability called Spider-Nonsense, which basically allows him to be more and more cartoony the more danger he is in, which is the perfect reason to have the wackiest nonsense happen that will save his piggy hide in some of the most imaginative ways possible. In at number one, the Red Bee. The Red Bee from DC Comics comes from a time in comic books and the superhero genre when superheroes were really just pulp vigilantes who had some kind of really minor edge over the criminals they would be thwarting. Rick Rally was the assistant to the district attorney and with this look at the criminal justice system, he grew tired of seeing criminals escape justice either through technicalities or because the court system was just too slow. Growing fed up, Rick decided he would create a costumed identity to bring criminals to to justice. But as a normal, pretty intelligent guy with a flawless moral compass and a decent right hook, he didn't really have an edge over those he was facing. Enter Michael. Michael was a trained bee like the insect that Rick would keep in his belt buckle. Rick was a unique kind of bee though. As we know, bees don't survive for too long after they sting someone. Luckily though, Michael had the advantage of being able to sting multiple times. Michael, coupled with Rick's fists and other equipment would be the bane of villains everywhere and thus the red bee was born. Number 10, Norman Osborn. Norman Osborn wasn't always a villain, but many things in his life shaped him to become the greedy, insane, and focused iconic Spider-Man nemesis we know him as today. It all started when Norman was young. Hearing that his parents were having financial issues, he learned at a young age that it was important to look out for number one above all others to ensure his own survival. Number one is 
Norman Osborn, by the way. His father mistreated him and was known as a failure, and this drove young Norman to strive to do better than his old man, striving for excellence in all things at any cost. When his wife died, it only served to inspire Norman to throw himself into his work even more. He cut out his business partner and began searching for formulas that he could profit off of, ending up discovering and creating the Goblin Serum, which made him smarter and stronger, but at the cost of his sanity. Number nine, Harley Quinn. More of a a psychological horror story as well, Harley Quinn ended up losing her sanity and parts of herself in her love of the Joker. It was her love for him that drove her to a life of crime and made her the villain initially that she became. She's now since found a way out of this darkness, dumped the Joker, and even moved more towards becoming a hero, even teaming up with Batman as his newest sidekick. But you can't deny how dark her origins were. In the limited series Harleen, we get a more sexy version of her fall into a life of crime and a fall into her love for the Joker but even that shows just how much Harley spiraled down into the beautiful and freeing pit of insanity with Mr. J. It also tells us a tale of her being trapped in Arkham Asylum during a breakout with various villains around every corner, and not all of them are friendly towards Dr. Quinzel. In the end, she is forced to choose between the two sides of herself and ends up shattering into complete insanity after killing a security guard who she kind of considered to be her friend, turning away from her saner persona of Dr. Quinzel and fully becoming an embodied Studying Harley Quinn. I just love too that the panel is like literally her shattering. Number eight, Prince Zuko. Okay, so while this might not be a comic book character, I still find Zuko of Avatar to have one of the most traumatic and horrifying stories out there. And I also just like Prince Zuko, so I wanna talk about it. Not only that, but he's just a great villain because a lot of the reasoning behind who he is also helps to justify what he does and makes him a better villain because of that. And that makes him a better villain. A great villain in my mind needs to have a motivation that you can actually connect with. Their need to do something that goes against every moral code that they have learned or that society has, has to feel justified to the point that you may even feel bad for them at times or even find yourself rooting for them. After all, we aren't born villainous. It's usually a sense of injustice that makes us feel we have no other option but to break the rules, tear down the establishment, and question our own morals in order to get done what we need done. You have to be pushed to the brink to get to the point that you actually shift into a villain in reality. And Zuko definitely was that. A lot of what he does is that of wanting to win back his father's love and because he is understandably afraid of his father as well. He became a villain as a result of his punishment at the hands of his father, where he was burned in a forced duel against him and then later exiled as well. Number seven, Carnage. Even before Cletus Cassidy was Carnage, he was terrifying and the villain only has become more terrifying ever since then. Cletus was born into a family with a history of mental health problems and from a young age, it seemed as though there was always something off about him. It's like he was destined to become a villain. He showed all the expectant signs of becoming a psychotic, sociopathic serial killer, and well, that's just what happened. He was raised by a woman who we can only assume was his grandmother, as his mother died seemingly from childbirth. He was also born in Ravencroft, so I feel like that is some kind of foreboding as to what type of child he could grow up to be. His supposed grandmother mistreated him while raising him, and he paid her back in kind by pushing her down the stairs. Yikes! From there, he went to live with a family who is believed to have been his biological father and his stepmother mother, though I don't think that's ever really confirmed, that also didn't end well. Roscoe, his apparent dad, mistreated him as well, and his stepmother ended up dead, caught in the middle of the conflict. Roscoe was arrested because of her death, and Cletus ended up at an orphanage. While there, he unleashed his wrath on fellow orphans and administrators, even killing a few outright, and eventually burned the orphanage to the ground. Seriously, this is just something out of a horror movie. Number six, The Broken. I don't know why, but this villain's tale just always sticks with me for some reason. No matter what, I just think it's that initial panel of Batman's like head and torso together, which is like separated from the rest of his body, but suspended with like thick coiled wires and he's in immense pain. That really does it for me. It just is like, I don't know. I just think it's so scary. The Broken is an alternate version of Batman who comes from the dark multiverse. He appeared in the retelling of Nightfall where instead of Batman winning the day on his earth, he lost in the fight to reclaim Gotham against Azrael, who he'd appointed as his replacement after Bane 
broke his back. Azrael won and became Gotham's protector, Saint Batman, and Bruce became his permanent prisoner. His limbs were removed from his body, but he was kept alive, just as like a head and a torso, kept in immense pain on what I assume is like a life support machine, but also kind of a torture device. He suffered intense migraines and seizures while kept this way. Eventually he was freed by Bane's son and escaped Saint Batman, taking back Gotham, but this entire experience left him broken, turning him into an even worse villain than Saint Batman was. So he like reclaims the city, but you're like, oh no. Oh dear, not good. Number five, Superman. Wait a minute, what? Superman isn't a villain? Well, not in the main continuity, but in the alternate reality of Injustice, he most certainly is a villain. How did this come about? Well, after Superman was tricked into fighting Doomsday, only to realize he had been made to hallucinate by the Joker and Harley, who used fear toxin on him. What had actually been happening was that Superman had been fighting Lois Lane, not his nemesis Doomsday. He realizes this all too late, sadly, as he discovers he has killed Lois. Not only that, but she was pregnant. And not only that, but the Joker and Harley had also tied a trigger for a nuclear explosion to Lois's heart. As a result, when her heart stopped, Metropolis, Superman's shining city, was blown to bits. It's really no wonder he became such a cold and deadly villain. He felt that he needed to fix the world as a result of these events. Of course, he went about that in a way that I'm sure Lois would not have been proud of had she still been alive to see Superman fight in her and Metropolis's name. Number four, Killer Frost. Killer Frost was originally scientist Caitlin Snow, who had been on the hunt for a perpetual motion energy conducting machine that many believed to be a myth. She sought to continue the research of Dr. Louise Lincoln, who had been working to make such a machine, which she called a self-sustaining thermodynamic ultraconductor engine. Caitlin's colleagues warned her against following in Dr. Lincoln's footsteps, but she paid them no mind. When she finished the engine, they turned on her, revealing their true colors. They were actually working for the evil organization known as Hive, and sought to destroy Snow and Lincoln's work, preventing the invention from ever being used or discovered. They trapped Caitlin within in the engine and started it up in order to destroy her. Terrified, Caitlin panicked and tore out the wires for the coolant system. This had an unexpected result and Caitlin Snow found herself bonded with ice and basically became a heat vampire. With her new ice-based powers, she escaped and killed all of the hive agents. Craving heat as a result of her condition, she would later discover that exposure to Firestorm's powers temporarily reverted her to normal and would dedicate her life to pursuing him, seeking a permanent cure. Number three, Zombie Spider-Man. I know he's another alternate hero turned villain. But what can I say? They get some of the spookiest origins because they kind of have the most to lose. Heroes like have usually higher stakes than villains. When it comes to Spider-Man's origins in the zombie verse, he was of course infected with the zombie virus, which made him a villain. But as this change came upon him, he found himself tragically and horrifyingly feeding on his own family members that he tried desperately for years to keep safe. Spider-Man started off his brain and flesh eating spree by eating those he'd loved the most in a horrific twist. He devoured Mary Jane and his Aunt May, likely crying all the while, I imagine, but unable to stop himself. He was just so hungry. Number two, Bane. It's really no surprise that Bane became a supervillain considering he grew up in prison, serving time for crimes he did not commit, but that his father committed. Bane's father was a revolutionary who had escaped the prison, and when Bane was just 17, he was imprisoned in his father's place. He spent most of his life inside a cell that was connected to the ocean. All day he would spend in mind-numbing seclusion, alone in his cell, and at night he would have to swim for his life while trying to stay afloat above the water that filled up his prison cell almost to the very top, but not quite. Crabs and leeches would cling to his body cutting him throughout each tormented night, and insects who happened to be sharing the cell with him would climb up on his face seeking refuge. Every moment he ever spent outside of his cell afterwards would be focused on becoming stronger and smarter, preparing himself to one day escape the prison and accrue power once outside its walls. Number one, Magneto. One of the scariest stories out there in terms of supervillain origins is that of Magneto, made more scary by the fact that it's actually based off of real world circumstances experienced by many many victims of the events tied to World War II. Magneto grew up being trapped along with many of his family in a camp by World War II German soldiers. Now, I apologize for not being able to say the words that I would like to say here to give this topic the weight that I think it deserves. I think we all agree. But there are certain words and phrases that we are permitted from speaking on this platform, so I apologize for my lighter turn of phrase here and my potentially perceived levity. I promise I do take this subject very seriously. Um, and if you have problems with the fact that we can't say certain words, I would highly recommend that you 
contact the platform and let them know your thoughts on that. Because yeah, I think that's important to do. Young Magneto would not only have to suffer in these camps, but he'd also have to watch as one by one his family members attempted to escape and often got so close to being truly free, only to be reined back in and pretty much all end up dead in the end. He was forced into taking care of the bodies and disposing of all who perished at the camp as well, becoming a Sonder Commando, which must have felt like psychological torture as well as being grueling work. Sonder Commandos were actually real world special units, by the way, that existed during World War II, made up of Jewish prisoners from the camps who were forced into disposing of the victims who had been killed in the camps, threatened with their own deaths if they refused the work. In the end, Magneto did escape, but even then he was met with tragedy. He and his loved Magda would escape and start a family, finding a home in a village in the mountains. But after he was revealed to be a mutant, the people turned on him and his family, burning their home to the ground. As Magneto attempted to save his daughter, who was trapped on the upper floor of their home, soldiers attacked him, preventing him from doing so, and she died in the fire. 